I am grateful for the chance to be back with all of you. Uh, I have to tell you, I, look, I'm glad for the virtual uh, ability that we have here to be able to um, to reach everyone here, but I I miss not seeing all of you face to face in person. All right, but it's uh, it's good to be here with all of you, nonetheless, and uh, we're praying that this will be an opportunity for us to have a, a transformational experience uh, with the Lord Jesus. Um, you know, throughout the year, there are several different weeks of prayer that are offered throughout the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world. But uh, I don't take it for granted that anyone would even be here. Uh, we have a lot of things to do. Everyone is busy. Um, we're distracted. But, you know, those that have been touched by the Holy Spirit, uh, we understand that there's no such thing as being too busy to sit at the feet of the Master. And this was the story of Mary and Martha in that uh, wonderful story when Jesus was going to visit their home. But uh, that's not our topic for today. But I am really grateful that you are all here and I ask simply this, that uh, you don't waste your time, uh, that uh, none of us will waste our time. Let us come here uh, looking for a transformational experience with Jesus Christ. And yesterday, actually, I, I'm going to have a uh, PowerPoint presentation here that I want to share uh, today as we go through these things. So uh, tonight's topic is the power of youthful service uh, from this week's topic that you all have selected, which is life in the fast lane. And um, we are definitely in the fast lane, heading somewhere. And that's part of the reason why I really like this title. If you're in the fast lane, it means you're in a hurry to get somewhere. There's some place that you're going. And uh, this week, in each one of the topics, I think it is very important to understand where it is that we uh, think that we're going. Where is God calling us? And in fact, that was really the topic that we looked at last night. Where is God calling us to? What is the purpose? You know, we were talking yesterday about uh, resilience and what it takes to be resilient. And I just want to take a, a quick moment and review or recap just a little bit about what we talked about last night, because it is very foundational to everything else that we're going to be doing throughout the week. You see, uh, resilience, this ability to recover or to recuperate, to get back into the original shape after we've experienced some pressure or stress in life. That ability, especially for the Christian, is dependent upon our willingness to listen to, to hear the voice of God. And that's why it's so important in a week of prayer that we understand this. We are praying and we are listening. We are asking God to do something uh, transformational for us, something special for us to call us in his direction. Because as we talked about last night, God takes uh, ownership. He takes some responsibility to support us and to encourage us, but he's not taking responsibility when we're headed in the, a different direction. When we're headed in the wrong direction, God is not in the business of answering our prayers and supporting us as we go in an independent direction and on our own way. No, God is a God of order. The God of creation always has intentionality and he always has purpose in everything that he does. God is not arbitrary. He does not do anything by accident. And so if you are here, whatever you're doing, God has an intention and a purpose for you. Uh, everything that, every circumstance in your life involves intention 
and purpose. So whether it is that we are dating or whether we are getting married or if it's a job or maybe a promotion that we're seeking, all of these different kinds of things, we lay them all at the altar of the Lord. And we ask him to help us to be resilient, to be strong, because we understand that everything that is in our life belongs to him. The purpose of everything we have belongs to him. So we don't want to rush too quickly and ask the Lord to just remove all trials, all burdens, and all uh, trouble from us. Because sometimes, as we'll see today, sometimes those challenges come as a part of God's blessing, as a part of God's purpose. The challenge is, therefore, for the Christian not to escape trouble, but to be able to endure trouble, to be able to endure hardship, to be able to be resilient. We don't want to be resilient in walking in these independent paths away from God, no. But we do want to be resilient because we know that we live in a fallen world, a dark world, a world that is actually trying to destroy us, trying to destroy our, our lives in the here and now, body and soul. So destroying us also for eternity. That is the enemy's intention, his purpose, and his plan. But if you have accepted Jesus Christ, if you have understood that God himself, the creator of heaven and earth and all of the universe, if he has given his life for you and you said, Lord, I don't deserve this. I don't understand how you could do this for me, a sinner, someone who was your enemy or someone who didn't care. But you kept forgiving me, you kept pursuing me. And so Lord, when I see how good you have been to me and I give myself back over to you, to, to the Lord, when I do that, I don't wanna do that just for one moment or just for one day. I want to be resilient. Every one of us knows somebody. Maybe you are the one who has given yourself to Christ. You've made a decision for Jesus. You've found that you're moving with him in one moment, but in the next moment, you find that it was too much for you. You're overwhelmed. Uh, you're backsliding or you're back where you were before, and you wonder, how did I get there? No, we need resilience. We need strength in our faith in order to be able to uh, proceed forward and to make it to the finish line. I love that passage where Paul says, I have run the race, I've finished the course. Oh, I want to be able to say that one day. Brothers and sisters, we are not there yet. Thank God, because it means that there's work still for us to do. As Paul said in Philippians uh, chapter one, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Sorry about that. Let me put that on silence. All right. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That means if you're alive today, that means there is purpose in your presence right now. But whatever the purpose is, it's going to require one thing. It requires resilience. It requires sticking with it, even through the hard times even when we are disappointed. And the key to that, the best key to that, well, there's basically there's two keys. Number one, the best key is walk by faith and not by sight. That's why the topic yesterday was resilience through faith. When we walk by faith, that means that the journey that we're on is God's journey. That means that the good shepherd is walking ahead of us. He's making a way for us. Now, the way he's making for us might still be difficult. It might be an uphill climb. There might be, and no, there will be challenges. There might be persecution. There might be trouble. But the Savior, the good shepherd, is going ahead of us. And he will never leave you. He will never, ever forsake you. So have no fear, my friend. 
in order to be resilient, we choose God's way, not our own way. We choose God's way, not the world's way. And when we're on God's path, we will have all of the resources of heaven. We will have the power of the Holy Spirit walking with us to make sure that we get to the finish line because that was God's purpose in the first place. God does not invite you and me on a journey that he does not intend to see us complete. And this is why when we look at the text that uh, was given to us for today, Jeremiah chapter 42 and verse 3, uh, these uh, people, they're asking, in the midst of great pressure, in the midst of a trial, in the midst of an army before them, they say that the Lord may show us the way in which we should walk and the things we should do. They're tempted to go back to the old ways, but they're saying, no, not my will, but thy will be done. So we're going to talk about that. Resilience and faith all have to do with the will of God and the purposes of God. And so today, as we are talking about uh, youthful service, we are necessarily going to be talking about the purposes of God. Now, um, when we look in the Bible at Jesus as he is training these young people who are his disciples, that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about Jesus, he's also uh, a, a young man, uh, and he has his disciples all around him. These are also young men, and he is training them to be the builders of the kingdom, to be the people who would uh, have really the, the keys to the kingdom, to really express to the entire world the loving character and nature of God himself, so that the world would be drawn to him and be prepared for his return. My friends, that is exactly, identically the calling that God has for us today as Seventh-day Adventists. It is the purpose and the mission of this church to prepare the world for the Lord Jesus' soon return. The purpose is, is identical between what Jesus was doing with the disciples and what he's doing with this church here today. And I'm not saying every other Christian church shouldn't be doing that. They should be. But we have a unique calling in that we have understood and accepted the full word of God and the full warning and the full offer of God that many churches, they just don't understand. They don't know the urgency of the time, and they don't know the, the power of God's calling for this time. But I want to draw our attention uh, as we jump into this to uh, Matthew chapter 10. And in Matthew 10, Jesus has already been ministering. He's already uh, turned the water to wine at the wedding. He's already been uh, going through uh, the countryside, healing and doing some preaching. And now he is sending out uh, the 12. So you look at this in chapter 10, uh, verse, well, we'll start with verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Notice something here, that Jesus does not begin with these young people and say, young people, I am going to give you a, a seminary course, and we're going to go from Genesis all the way through the, the entire Old Testament, and I want to teach you how to explain everything there. No, uh, the Lord does not do that. What he says to them is he gives them purpose, and he gives them what? What does he give them? It's he's it, the Bible says he gives them power. And my friends, I want to tell you that Jesus is also giving you power. He has not called you to be weak. He's called you to be powerful, but it is power for a purpose. 
power for a purpose. And that purpose is service. We talked about this yesterday, how in James, uh, the book says that you don't have, maybe you don't have resilience, you don't have strength, you don't have the blessings that you uh, uh, would like to have, you don't have because you do not ask, right? But then James goes on, he says, and when you do ask, you ask, for the wrong purpose, so that you can spend on yourselves. James is saying, that is the reason why you don't have. Those are the two reasons. Either you don't ask God in the first place, but here we are in the middle of the week of prayer. So here we are, we are asking God to give us everything that's available to us under heaven. Jesus, will you please bless us? We're asking God. But then there are still going to be a group of people who are, even though they're asking God, they will still not receive. And the reason they won't receive is because they're asking with the wrong purpose. You see, they have not aligned themselves with the mission and with the purpose of God. In other words, they're not involved in the mission to serve. They are involved in the mission to be served. They're asking because they want what they want for themselves. But the call of Christ and to walk on the path of Christ, to live in Christ, is to be on the path of service. There is no other path. There is no other path. And one of the mistakes that we make in our Christian journey, even as Adventists, is that we are becoming like so many other denominations, so many other churches out there, where we feel that the purpose of church is for us to come and fellowship together and to enjoy our time together, to enjoy the music, to enjoy the preaching, to enjoy uh, the food if there's lunch afterward, and to enjoy all these things, to enjoy ourselves. Let me, let me be clear. We're going to be clear as we go through uh, several passages today. The purpose of coming into this faith is so that we can reveal the image of the glory of God through dedicated service to God. And so Jesus is calling these young, uh, these young disciples in the same way he's calling you. And Jesus begins by giving you power, but he's giving you power with the expectation that you will use it. How will you use it? You will use it in service. Let me jump ahead to uh, verse uh uh, let's see. Seven, where Jesus is speaking here, and he says, as you go, so this is assumed, you are going to obey, you are going to get involved in service. He says, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom is at hand. That's a very short sermon. It's a very short sermon. The kingdom is at hand. And then he goes on, this is your ministry now, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's your work. That is the calling. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as a disciple of Jesus Christ who is not fundamentally, primarily engaged in service to the world in the name of Jesus. And there are too many supposed believers in the world who are saying, you know, I return tithe and I come to church, but, uh, you know, uh, they are not involved in sacrificially serving their neighbor. They don't know what it is to pick up a cross, meaning bearing the burden of someone else, because that's what Jesus did when he picked up the cross. He picked up your burden. He picked up my burden, and he carried it for me. My friends, if you want to follow Christ, you better understand the calling and the priority of picking up someone else's burden and carrying it for them. And, and it's picking up the burden of someone who does not deserve for you to pick it up for them. Someone who, who um, is unable to pick up their burden. We look in Genesis chapter 1, 27 and 28. This is a passage we read yesterday. And Jesus created men and women on the earth, and he immediately gave them purpose. 
He says, God bless them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Subdue it means, God said, I'm giving you a perfect world. I've designed it, but now I'm handing it over to you. Let's see what you can do with this. Can you do some things with this world? Can you invent some things? Can you, can you use your, your own creativity to uh, make adjustments and improvements and, 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 and invent and develop and create? What will you do with what I'm giving you? God is saying to so do it. He's giving them a purpose. And he says, have dominion. There is purpose in all of this. But the underlying purpose after those duties of subduing and having dominion, the fundamental purpose is to reflect the image of God. So in all your subduing, in all of your creating, in all of your using of your talents, your skills, your opportunities, your education, your physical strength, your talent, your, your abilities, all of those things are to be dedicated to the one fundamental primary mission, which is to reflect, reflect and reveal the image of God. I want to turn our attention to God's perspective on service. And I, and I often uh, refer to these passages. Uh, we're going to go through a few passages in the next uh, few minutes. Let me just take a look at the time here. Um, <clears throat> Jesus is, or the Lord is talking to his faithful people, and he says to them, these are faithful people who are worshiping at the altar. They're worshiping in the sanctuary. They are doing uh, all of the right things to come and worship him. These are good, if you will, Seventh-day Adventist young people who are coming to the temple to worship, and they're singing the songs, and they're going through the, the traditional program, and the Lord says, to what purpose? is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of ram, rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear for me, who has required this from your hands to trample my courts? God is saying, listen, if this is all you're coming to do, to do all the religious things and go through the Sabbath program, go through the prayer meeting program, and we say that we've been there, we pray, and we sing, and that's it. No. God goes on, verse 16, he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. He says, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. This is the calling. God, God is saying here, listen, if I have to choose between you coming to church and, and having a nice church program, powerful preaching, powerful music, uh, you have communion service, we love all of that. If I have to choose between that and you going out and seeking justice and rebuking the oppressor, making a difference, for street children, for prostitutes, for drunkards who have lost hope, for families that are going through struggles and divorce and so forth. If I have to choose between you coming to the church and worshiping in what we call worship and you going out and being salt and light and blessing the world, healing people, making their lives better, God is saying right here, there's no comparison. I want you to go out and serve. This is when Jesus says, uh, the, the, the Lord says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. And what he's saying when he says that, he says, listen, uh, you know, just think about what I'm saying here. Think about what the word of God says. Use your common sense, the Lord is saying. Go and serve. Through your, though your sins be like scarlet, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And so in this passage, the Lord is saying, listen, don't just come worship me. Don't just get involved in religious activities. No, I want you to be a blessing to the world in my name. 
And when you do that, listen, guess what's going to happen? As you are blessing the world, I'm going to bless you. There are so many of us that are listening right now, and we need, you know, you need forgiveness. There's something you're calling out to the Lord. Lord, can you please forgive me? I've fallen again. Can you, Lord, please change me? I don't know how to get out of this struggle that I'm in. God is saying, if you will just use your common sense and follow my spirit and go and bless those, bring justice and healing and relieve oppression in the world, you go and serve in my name. And the Lord is saying, even though your skins, your, your sins rather, are, are like scarlet, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to bless you as you serve. The serving does not bring the forgiveness. It's only the blood of Jesus that does that. But see, in the process of aligning ourselves with the mission and purposes of God, we open up an avenue whereby God can come through and he can touch our lives and he can transform us. That is how we are blessed through service. It is the path of the Christian. There is no such thing as a Christian who is not in service. There is no such thing. And when we do this, we will eat the good of the land. Not only will we, we be forgiven and blessed spiritually, but God says he's going to bless you in this world. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Are you loyal to God's purposes? My friends, the Lord is looking for an opportunity to bless you. He's looking for an opportunity to go out of his way to do good for you. But your mission cannot be, Lord, how can you do good for me? No, no, no. No, no. The Lord is saying, get your heart aligned with my heart. I've created this world with the idea that you would subdue it, that you would be blessing the world using the power that I've given you. And when you, uh, you reveal yourself to be my true son and my true daughter, I will spend all of my time, all of my day, all of my days looking for a way to strongly support you. Praise God, we have a God that wants to support us. We don't do these things out of a sense of obligation or burden. We need to be asking God to, to transform us. And that's why this passage here in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 is so important. We all know it. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare, look at this purpose now. You, you're all those wonderful things. You're chosen, you're royal, you're a priesthood, you're holy, you're a special possession. But as we said, God never does anything without a purpose. His purpose is so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You and I, we need to receive the calling of God. We need to receive that calling and leave the darkness. Take a step in faith. Begin that journey of service. And we we'll declare his praises by sharing his praises. And we'll see that as we go through even more verses here, here today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is the purpose. This is the point. We are God's handiwork. We see this. This verse is referencing what we read in Genesis chapter 1. We are God's handiwork. He created us. He created us in Christ Jesus. And just as he immediately gave Adam and Eve work to do, this is exactly what happens in the new birth. We are created in Christ. Why? to do good works. This, my friends, therefore, is what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. This is what it means. We go out into the world to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Yes, the Seventh-day Adventist keeps the Sabbath. Yes, the Seventh-day Adventist is concerned about the health message. Yes, the Seventh-day Adventist is concerned about proclaiming the three angels' messages. But how do we do that? We do that by doing good works. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday. We mentioned uh, uh, Matthew 5, 16, uh, where uh, Jesus is calling us to be uh, the light of the world and uh, to do good work so that the world will glorify our Father who is in heaven. We can go through so many verses. I, I, there's no way we have time to exhaust all of the verses in the Bible. And, and I'm sure you can even think of a few that I'm not including in here. But uh, this is just simply show from Genesis all the way to the end of Scripture and Revelation. You will see God's intention is that we will be getting involved in creation, that we will participate in him to be a blessing to creation. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Isaiah 58, I just want to read a couple of uh, quick verses here in Isaiah 58. Our, our time is running so fast. But um, it's so important. Now, Isaiah 58, is, as an Adventist, we will quickly jump to verse 13. If you turn your foot away from, turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and then there are blessings. But did you take a look at the beginning of this chapter? And the Lord is saying basically the same thing here that he said in Isaiah chapter 1, but I'm going to jump down for the sake of time. And um, go down to verse 6 and 7 and 8. These people are going through religious rituals. They are fasting and praying. But the Lord is asking, is this the fast that I've asked for? Going to verse 6, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Now he's explaining, this is the kind of fasting. If you're going to fast and, and pray, let me tell you, the kind of fasting that is my favorite kind, the Lord is saying. His favorite kind is that you and I, that we would loose the bonds of wickedness, that we would undo the heavy burdens, that we would let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? He's talking about the fast that is, that is the fast that he's chosen. And that you bring to your house, huh, nobody wants that verse. But here it is, in the Word of God. That means Seventh-day Adventists have got to be committed to this, because as Adventists, we, are, we just believe in the Bible. Whatever it says, that's what we believe. That's what we always say. That's what we mean. So look at this verse. The fast that the Lord is asking every young person, every Seventh-day Adventist, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. Have mercy. When you see the naked, that you cover him, Seventh-day Adventist young person. And not hide yourself from your own flesh, from your own brother and sister who, who is suffering out there. Now, here's the blessing. What a blessing. Then your light shall break forth in the morning. Uh, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. That means the Lord is going to be right there behind you, supporting you, pushing you forward, uh, you know, urging you forward, carrying you if necessary. This is the Lord that you will have. This is the power you will experience from him. When we get involved in serving our fellow men and women in the world, sacrificially inviting them into our home, clothing them, helping them, the word says, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. You're there for my children. I am going to be there for you. This is what the Lord has said 
James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted for the world. My brothers and sisters, do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to actually walk by faith and not by sight? You see, sight says, oh, no, 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 I can't give... Uh, I don't really have the money. I've got to pay my bills. Your sight says you don't have enough money. But faith says, I've got a brother and a sister in me. Give. The Lord Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 5 says, give to anyone who asks you. Walking by faith. Do you have the courage and the faith to do it, my young person? What's holding you back? We've got enough Seventh-day Adventists who are ready to walk by sight to what makes sense, to what seems rational. And I know that when you walk by faith, it is not going to be easy. It is going to cost you. In fact, it's going to cost you everything. We're not preaching like other churches do. They say, hey, if you come to God, come to God and God is going to bless you. God's going to take you to Europe. God's going to take you to America and take you to the finest universities. You're going to have a good job. You're going to have a nice car. No, no, no. We're not saying that. We're saying that when you come to Jesus, you will have Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you will have the heart of Jesus Christ in you. You will have his power flowing through you to heal and to bless the world. And that you will know the fellowship of his suffering. You will be united in Christ. My friends, what's better than that? What is better than that? What else can the Lord even do for us, if not that? My friends, there are so many promises that we've just read in here, where the Lord does promise that when we have the heart of Christ, the Lord blesses us as if we are Christ. As if. We're not if, but as if. And he will bless you. He will support you. You have nothing to fear. Nothing to lose, young person, young man, young woman. You have nothing to fear. And the challenge is, are you going to choose to be different? Are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to walk by faith and not by sight? Be a radical Christian who has sold everything out to Christ. Your entire life is service. Your career is service not to the company you work for, but to the king of heaven and earth. All of that education you have, all of your skills, every opportunity should be devoted to the glory of God, not to yourself. Every shilling you earn on that job, is it belongs to God first. So then we ask the Lord, Lord, should I buy this house? Lord, should I buy this car? Lord, should I do this? Should I do that? Can I buy these clothes? Will it help me to reveal your glory in the world? Lord, please show us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. Now, these young people in Jeremiah chapter 42, when you look down at verse 6, it says, whether it is pleasing or displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. My friends, we have to walk by faith, not by sight, not by feeling, not by what is convenient. I want to urge you, as young men and women, understand the calling of God. And when you decide to put your life on his path and not on the path of the world, choose his path. When you do that, you will be blessed. The Lord is looking to and fro. His eyes are searching to and fro, looking to strongly support you. You will ride high above the earth. The Lord will bless you abundantly. You don't have to worry about that. Just surrender everything. Hold nothing back. The measure to which 
in which you measure out to others that are in need is the measure which God will use as he measures out blessings for you. My friends, I want to pray for you that you're going to be able to make the challenging choice to follow God, to serve him, to walk with him, to obey him. This is what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, 100% committed to the humanitarian cause of blessing the children of God, no matter where you find them, no matter what they're doing, no matter where they are. You have been given the power, the intellect, the strength, the skills, the opportunities that you have for one purpose, that you will glorify him through serving others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for every man and woman, every child that's here uh, listening to your word. Now, this is not my word. But Lord, I'm humbled by this. Lord, I am broken. I am broken by your word as I as as you have revealed to me the, the purpose that you have. Oh, Heavenly Father, please let us be not the Adventist church of the past. We're asking that you give us a new vision and a new purpose. The calling of the Seventh-day Adventist church member is not expressed in church services. It is expressed outside of those services as we bless the world, giving all that we are and all that we have for the glory of your name, Lord, for you and you alone are worthy, Lord Jesus. You are worthy, Lord Jesus. Help us to give our everything because that is what it means to follow you. Lord, I pray for the New Life Church and all who are watching and listening. Bless us now, Lord, as you call us and send us out to go and serve. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.